um, I'm about to visit Crown Hill Fort, which is one of uh, Plymouth's, or Plymouth's best preserved and uh, well-maintained Palmerston forts from the Victorian era. And it's situated just behind those trees on the top of the hill there. Um, just thought I would take this shot to show how strategically well positioned it is. And um, I'll chat to you a little bit more. I'm on the south side of the fort at the moment, on the Plymouth side. Um, but I want to take you to the north of the fort and just show you a few things on that side and walk you around the perimeter before we actually go into the uh, open day of the fort, which isn't for an hour or so yet, anyway. Okay, this is the entrance to the fort here. But I wanted to take you just a little bit further up the road before we go in and uh, show you a few things of interest and walk you around the outside of the fort. As I say, we've got quite a while yet before it opens to the public. So we're just off the main road now. It's the other side of that drive through restaurant, uh, away from a little bit of the traffic noise. Um, but I wanted to bring you here just to talk about um, the defences of Plymouth in general and Crown Hill Fort in particular before we go around it. Um, basically, Plymouth is on a sort of isthmus with the sea to the south and uh, rivers to the west and east. So the only kind of main road out of it is um, the road that we were just on, which is part of the reason why it's so busy. Um, there's, there's no road over to the east until you get to a, the kind of uh, where the river Plym begins to narrow and it's very marshy, easily, easily defendable ground and to the west there's not, there's not a road leading west for miles um, and the only way over is by ferry um, right up until the time of the building of the Tamar Bridge which is still quite a long way outside Plymouth. Um, so this is the main route and it's also the um, source of Plymouth's winter, uh, water supply since the time of the Elizabethans. Um, Francis Drake was mayor of Plymouth at one stage and he commissioned um, a leet, the traces of which you can see here. Um, so there's a little bit of information about it here. But um, so it's got so Crown Hill Fort, which is you can't see it through all the buildings and trees and things, but it's not far from here, just over the over the brow there. Um, is placed in a very strategic position, and it's also um, it uses the leak. The leak goes underneath um, the fort itself, um, which gives it a kind of se secure water supply as well. Um, now, prior to Victorian times, obviously, um, Plymouth was um, well outside of artillery range here. Um, Crown Hill is actually uh, de derives its name from the fact that the Royalist Army during the siege of Plymouth in the English Civil War um, camped their army here. Um, just down the, the way on the left there, off to the left, a place called Widdy Court was where um, Charles had his uh, court for a while. Um, but obviously as uh, artillery ranges and so on grew, then it was necessary to push the defences of Plymouth further out. And um, at the time of uh, Palmerston's prime ministership, um, the threat of French invasion was very real and um, the so-called Palmerston Follies or Palmerston Forts were built around the two main naval bases in the south of England on the channel, uh, Plymouth and Portsmouth. And um, much of the design was um, built on the experiences of the British in the Crimean War. Um, so the siege of Sevastopol, itself a naval port, um, heavily influence the design and positioning of these forts. They, they are very ingeniously positioned. It's difficult to get a, 
um, a, a true idea of how clever it is, but um, this spot we're standing on here would easily be within range of the fort's guns if you were an attacking infantry man. Um, but the forts are all designed uh, to defend one another. So the guns in the fort just over the brow there um, were better suited to firing on uh, attackers of the neighbouring forts rather than this one. And this fort relied on um, its neighbours to defend it. Uh, but of course, as you got closer, the guns could fire down. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. I want to show you a particular spot um, in a moment. But anyway, let's let's just start making our way back down the leak, and um, we'll get to a place where you can actually see the fort itself rather than rather than talk about it. So there's the there's the leak going down there. Okay, you can just see a little bit more of the leet going south there. Okay, we're very close to the fort now. You can see one of the embrasures there. Uh, so just talk a little bit more about the way it would defend itself from attackers. So the principal threat to you if you were an attacker, as I say, would have been not the guns from this fort, but the guns from the neighbouring fort, which would long, you know, a long way back from this would have started to pummel you. Um, the forts are, as I say, all positioned very carefully and, uh, you know, geographically uh, situated so that they're kind of concealed. You don't really see them until you're on top of them, but they're all on high points. And this one in particular was actually built on the um, remains of an Iron Age fort, which were always, or nearly always, situated on high, high points. Um, the Iron Age fort completely disappeared when they built this structure though. Um, and then next up, you would have, behind the walls there, there are mortar pits which are concealed, sunk, sunk um, you know, lower than the parapets obviously, and they would actually be firing on attackers who were actually threatening this fort itself. Um, if you got through all that, then the next uh, obstacle you had to overcome was believe it or not actually beneath the ground here um, under this under this field here stretching quite a long way off that way um, was what's known as a fugas so it's a subterranean tunnel packed full of explosive and a communicating tunnel um, goes across uh, to the fort itself there and it, it would be ignited by a cannon being fired down the down the length of the tunnel and this whole area would just go up in one massive uh, explosion um, so that would deter the attack as well I mean the, the, as, as I forgot to tell you earlier um, this position is a very strategically important area and it was used during the um, Second World War as well in case of invasion from the Germans and this road was widened a few years back and the construction work was delayed on several occasions by the discovery of um, caches of grenades and mortar rounds and that kind of thing and they had to get the bomb squad in to remove them safely um, so that shows that the the home guard and the home defense were um, had, had spotted it as an ideal position to uh, to defend um, right so let's walk you up a little bit further keep the camera running as we're walking so what you can't actually see from this point is that when you get over the over the uh, to the other end of this field here, um, there's a huge defensive ditch, um, absolutely massive thing. And of course, um, they're called Palmerston's Follies, but uh, mainly because they were never used against the French. Um, but it doesn't mean that they weren't. 
a strategic importance, you know, during the whole history of, of Britain since, you know, since the Victorian era. Um, so they weren't a folly in that respect. And uh, if you look at some of the cities, say, in France and even eastern Germany um, during the First and Second World Wars, um, a lot of them used, a lot of battles actually used um, older defences. So you've got places like Verdun, which has got, uh, it's not only got the sort of Vauban defences around the immediate sort of town of Verdun, it's city of Verdun itself, but it's got forts like this um, that were built during the Victorian era and then were very important to the defence of Verdun during the First World War. And in places like Prussia, Eastern Prussia and Poland, you have all the the defences that the Germans kind of still garrisoned when the, the Russians attacked. So there's a little bit of the, the ditch. You can see some of the uh, boot poles and so on in it. Let's take you, take you around a little bit closer to it. Okay, so we're just gonna climb over here and go onto this path that uh, goes around the perimeter of the, the moat or ditch on the outside. Okay, so there's quite a nice collection of uh, cannon in this fort. Um, some of them are being restored and occasionally they have uh, they fire sort of uh, dummy rounds from them and so on, but unfortunately um, the ones on this side of the fort, they had to stop doing that because they, it was causing traffic accidents um, on, Tavist on the Tavistock Road, the main road there, um, because drivers were uh, being startled by the loud bangs and so on and um, crashing into one another. They didn't actually hit anything with any rounds. Um, now, um, you might be able to see, you probably can see, some um, firing slits there in a long line. And they go, that is, um, that's what's known as a chemin de ronde. It goes right the way around the um, the fort and uh, allows infantry to sort of circle around the fort to get to the uh, the part that's most threatened and uh, fire on uh, the enemy on this side of the the ditch. Um, let's just take you a little bit further down, show you a bit more. Now I'll have to refresh my memory when we get inside the fort, but um, that particular. Um, gun emplacement up there has a, a technical name um, I forget what it is at the moment um, down here you can see what looks like a door and that is actually a sally port where um, obviously the attackers would have to find a way over and if they were they would have they would be obliged to go down here right down there you can see how deep it is um, but it once in there, um, if they got to a position where they couldn't be uh, dislodged by cannon fire and there were plenty of um, gun ports, you know, that could enfilade them anyway, but if all that failed, then the defenders could actually sally out um, of the, uh, the defences and fight in hand-to-hand -hand fighting with them. Um, so you know, yet another resort which the defenders could use. Uh, and down there, I think the, these sort of parts that are butting out are called caponiers, so literally a lot of the, a lot of the te technical terms are derived from French military uh, architecture, but a ca capon obviously is a, a chicken. So it was kind of uh, almost a derogatory term for where the uh, defenders could hide away, take take refuge as chickens, as it were. But you can just see um, in the distance there, let's try and zoom in on it. That opening on this side of the, the moat, or ditch, defensive ditch, is actually the tunnel 
um, through which the cannon would be fired. So it's, it's fired from within the fort, but um, a shot would be fired down there and it would ignite the fugas, which you know was quite an extensive length of uh, tunnelling. So the whole of this side of the uh, defence, the north of the defence, which is the side that the attack would be expected to come from, um, you know, would just be lifted. So it would take out huge thousands of, of attacking troops all in one go. A bit like the mines in the uh, on the Western Front in the First World War, or even um, Petersburg in the American Civil War. You can see what a good uh, field of fire those gun ports have. You'd hardly know we were right beside that main road now, would you? Right, you can just see here, if you follow the rifle slits along, it's a bit hard to find it on my uh, viewing screen in the sunlight here, but um, I think you can see about there that some of the Chemin de Ronde is um, covered and parts of it aren't. Um, so some of it, would, the defenders would be exposed to um, shrapnel and shrapnel bursts and things like that overhead. Um, but parts of it, I think it's on the other side, parts of it are covered, or maybe it's on this side, but it's certainly not covered there. And that's the closer view of the, uh, apologies, I don't know the name for it, but the uh, tunnel that leads through to the Fugas. So the cannon would be fired from over this side and the shot would go down the tunnel there. And there's another kind of um, area for infantry to fire rifles through the slits down there. You can see the mouth of a, a gun in that port now, I think. There is the uh, gun port through which the uh, gun that ignites the charge would be directed. And there's another sally port. Lost it in the viewfinder again, apologies nice sunny day today. It does have its disadvantages. There it is. So they would drop ladders down and pull them back up again once they retreated back into the fort. Yeah, I forgot to say earlier as well um, that once the forts had been completed, the British actually invited um, Toddlebane, who was the Russian engineering officer who had uh, supervised the defences of Sevastopol. They actually invited him over to inspect the uh, ring of forts around Plymouth, um, which seems an extraordinary thing to do. To, uh, but of course, uh, by that stage, Russia was no longer our enemy and it was the French who had been our allies in the Crimean War who posed the, uh, the main threat. But even so, um, you know, it was an extraordinary thing to do to to invite a, a foreign uh, military power to inspect your defences, you know, because it would give them the p potential to um, seek out its weak points. The next fort over in that direction is actually a just a battery. Um, at, at, um, and then there's Fort Austin. I forget, I think it's called the Gifford Battery. And then Fort Austin. Um, and then in this direction here, I think the fort is called Woodlands. But they basically um, extend from one river to the other. Uh, and there are even uh, defences on the other side of the, uh, the River Tamar many of which were put there 
during the Napoleonic era. And on Plymouth Sound itself, um, right out at Penley Point, there was a huge, absolutely huge cannon uh, positioned. Um, but they only fired it once and it literally came off its mountain, so it wasn't a success. Um, it was just such a powerful gun that it couldn't be couldn't be fired without damaging the, itself and the surroundings. It's been a couple of years since I visited this fort, and uh, last time I was here, they'd they cleared all this uh, vegetation off, so it gave you a bit more of an idea of the the sort of glassy and slope and so on. Um, and they frequently find artefacts in in this uh, ditch and so on. Be a great place for metal detectors or detectorists, I should say. Correct myself. Gives you some idea of the depth of the uh, the ditch. I was trying to research at one point um, inside the fort um, in one of the uh, gun emplacements there's obvious damage from a massive explosion which must, must have been accidental but also pretty devastating um, but there's no record of any deaths from it but when I was um, researching deaths that had happened in Crown Hall Fort um, found details of two. One was of a drunken soldier who fell off the balcony. I'll show you that later inside the fort. But another was an officer who was found dead in this, at the bottom of the stitch one morning. And he had clearly kind of stumbled over whilst um, under the influence maybe. Um, but the fall was sufficient to, to kill him. Yeah, it might be a bit easier to see there that the uh, Shamanda on just behind the rifle slits there is actually open to the sky at that point. I think that's pretty obvious from where the uh, the vegetation comes down to on the other side. It's not overgrown. Okay, we're really nearly back round to the south side now and uh, where the entrance is facing towards Plymouth. So we uh, timed it just about right, it's nearly one o'clock and uh, that's the opening time for the open day. They usually occur last Friday of most months during the, um, the high season, so not during the winter but uh, spring, summer and early autumn. Um, places run by the Landmark Trust now. Um, the officers' quarters are used as uh, holiday accommodation, which is very pleasant, as I understand. And uh, there's a few small businesses and things set up in some of the buildings within the within the fort, so they make a bit of money that way. Um, and they hold uh, reenactment days, sort of Victorian military reenactments, where they fire the cannons. Um, and so on, give displays. Uh, we'll get a little bit of a display today, but it's probably only going to be a small cannon, uh, nothing particularly um, impressive. Um, and they offer things like uh, firing Martini Henry carbine, carbines and so on, with uh, blank am ammunition, obviously. Um, I've even got a friend of mine actually does run a business that, that rents one of the uh, 
sight soon here. Um, I don't think we'll see him today, maybe we will. But he's a war gamer and he um, occasionally throws uh, war games here. Um, has them in, I think it's in the old magazine. Um, never attended one, but um, he's invited me, but I've never been able to. But uh, maybe one day. There may even be a trig point up there because it is on very high, a high point. And uh, we're virtually at the entrance now, so first thing we've got to do is uh, report to the guard room and uh, pay an admission fee. Okay, so this is the only entrance in, and um, that window there is uh, because the officers' quarters were over that, in the building over the entrance there. So this is the parade ground. Um, some gun sheds over there. And, uh, we'll go up onto the ramparts rest of the way, I think, before it gets too crowded. I think the gun up there is called a Moncrief. It's sort of uh, the um, the firing of the gun causes it to uh, drop back down again so it's behind the uh, defences and then it's reloaded and raised up again over positioned over the parapet oh no that's the Moncrief there they've been working on that obviously can't see it again on the viewfinder but we'll get a better view closer up So that's the uh, structure whose name, technical name, I've forgotten. So we'll go and have a look at that first. It annoys me when I can't think of something, can't remember something. So it slopes so that uh, gun carriages could come up here. A lot of this grass was actually used to grow vegetables and so on. They put the night soil on it to fertilise it and um, made use of the green area to, to grow edibles. I think uh, it's a magazine, it must be. That's it. No wonder I forgot it. A double hexo casemate. And the gun is an Armstrong 7 inch rifled breech.
suspect this is the gun, the Armstrong, that used to cause the traffic accidents. So there's the road out there. We fired it at McDonald's. Right, the building with the balcony there is the barracks, and that is the balcony from which the Victorian soldier fell in a drunken state and killed himself. I think that's the magazine. And then one of those two buildings over there is a lime house for mixing lime. I forget which one. Probably tell us when we get around there. But we're going to have a look at this uh, Moncrief disappearing gun next, which is the next one up. Well, I must say it's in a much better state than the last time I saw it. Um, it was all covered in um, a sort of canvas over the top to keep the rain off and so on. Um, they've got it into a good state now, and uh, I think it's a replica. Parts of it might be original. But it basically lowers down once the, uh, the blast of the cannon so it, so it doesn't work as a disappearing gun any longer, so they can't obviously, they need to fire live shells in order for that to happen. And this one uh, that I mistook for, the Moncrief, I think is a Rodman. Um, but this is sort of very typical gun that you might see in uh, fortifications in the American Civil War and so on. Caron. You can see from the barrel, if I'm not mistaken, that um, one end of the barrel is less pitted, in fact hardly pitted at all, compared to this end. So you can probably bet that uh, the barrel was um, found as a sort of street bollard buried in the buried muzzle down into the ground so only the other upper half was uh, exposed to the elements and weathered a lot, an awful lot of old cannons have been um, dug up that were used as uh, bollards and things in streets the streets were widened and so on and of course now they're sought after as uh, demonstration objects. Okay, so we're up on above the barracks now and you can get a much better idea of how high up this uh, fort is, particularly. Over here, you can see down onto the river so if I can get a little bit closer and get you a better view. Okay, looking down on, uh, you can see the River Tamar in the distance there. Again, apologies because I'm having, I think that's as much as I can zoom in, but um, I think on the view in the middle there, you can see a bridge, and the, the bridge is going across the River Tavy, which joins the River Tamar. Um, so that little bit of land that you can see where the bridge joins is the uh, Beer Peninsula. But the Tamar goes down there and uh, Devonport is hidden from view. But the naval base is sort of behind there. Probably a bit further down that way. So we might get a view of the uh, neighbouring fort in a moment. Let's try and find it. So the officers' quarters are through there. Yeah, before I carry on, I think uh, in a couple of minutes there's going to be the first uh, of the talks, so I'm going to go and attend that first of all and then carry on filming afterwards. Officers' mess, you have pantries. Um, storage areas, servants' quarters, all that sort of thing that enables that building to function. 
Uh, nowadays, we have holiday accommodation within Central Five Casemates. I'm not sure whether we've got our holiday guests with us just yet, but pipe up if you are. Um, they're due to yeah, that was a very interesting uh, tour of the uh, three guns over there. I think I was wrong that week. That isn't a Rodman. It's an old... The one nearest us is uh, an old naval gun that was uh, reused in forts after the ships became uh, ironclad, so it was no longer effective against uh, naval targets, so they, they took a lot of them and put them on frames to use in forts inland and there's a demonstration of small arms at the moment going on so uh, I've seen that before and I'm, I think I'll skip that and walk around the ramparts while they're less crowded and noisy so we'll carry on see if we can see the uh, woodlands fort. That was something interesting that um, hadn't occurred to me that um, I might as well tell you before I forget is a lot of the trees in here were actually deliberately planted in the 1940s during the Second World War so that um, it was less uh, obvious from the air, hidden from uh, aerial attack, which is why it's hard to see that first shot I showed you from Tavistock Road. It seems to be concealed under the tree line. Um, some of them are then spread naturally but a lot of them are original plantings. So there's another view where hopefully you can see the, uh, the river in the distance and there's an area, a tree covered kind of hill which I'm pretty sure is Woodlands Fort but I wouldn't like to swear to it. take you back round, uh, he pointed out the view you get from the other side and there's, you can see quite a lot more of the local geography from the, uh, what would it be, the north east corner, I'll show you that later. Right. Yeah all these casemates are called, the bricked ones are called Haxo casemates. The one that I was showing you earlier was just a double version of the same. So it's sort of three courses of brick covered with a, to absorb the shell. Okay, here's a good uh, viewpoint on the top of the ramparts to see how far you can see. Um, as he was saying, uh, it's deliberately sloped at 20 degrees so that there's nowhere for attackers to take cover and uh, all the trees and things have been uh, have grown since the time when the fort was in use. Um, it would all have been clear, no buildings, no trees. But way over in the distance, you can even see, see if I can get it in shot, right on the horizon there's a sort of pimple, which is actually Brentor on uh, Dartmoor, famous tour with a, a church right on the top.
This is another cannon that's been in the ground. It actually says on the descriptive notice. This is back to the officers' quarters. Um, some of them are used for small businesses and about five of them are apartments that are rented out for tourist stays and so on. But this would have been a very comfortable existence for a Victorian officer. So these are transport cases for the wooden um, patterns that were used to cast the metal guns, if that makes sense.
I know. <laughs> no one will come looking for them. set up home here. <laughs> well, I think in the past... The carriage itself is a reproduction, but the gun actually fires more now than it ever did in this time. We're obviously going to be firing blank ammunition, and we're going to be firing black powder. When we do it, what I want you to do is prepare yourself to put your hands over your ears and like that. Okay? Do not put your fingers in your ears. Okay, I will give you a warning. I will only do one, two, three, and firing. We will blow the whistle and let you know in the area that we're going to do it. But your hands need to be over your ears. And that's important. Thank 
I want now is embers in there when I put the next jar in the black bag. Right then, I think I've uh, covered everything there is to be seen today. Um, enjoyed that visit. The Tunnels Underground wasn't quite as an extensive tour as I've taken in the past. I only went through one of the Caponiers. I mean, there's about two thirds of a mile of tunneling and so on, just on each level, three levels. So there's a lot more to be seen down there, but uh, it was a very limited short tour, but um, the water pits, for instance, didn't go through any of those. But other than that, pretty 